Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, to the Chelsea Roar, the Chelsea show that we bring you by the fans for you, the fans. As always, I am your host, Ian Kelly, and today I've got a very, very special guest on the Chelsea Roar, a man that I have gained a lot of respect for. Not that I didn't have any before, by the way, sorry, Ben, uh, but a man that you will all recognize as the... Uh, the calming, soothing voice during the whole Chelsea takeover, the one and only Mr. Ben Jacobs. Ben, welcome to the show, my friend, and thank you for taking the time out. Thanks for having me, Ian. Now you'll get the opportunity to work out whether the actual voice on a podcast is as calming as it sounded on Twitter. It's always funny because you read a thread and everyone will just give their own voice and then you appear on a podcast and suddenly you get the opportunity to hear the voice which I think is okay and then see the face which is less preferable you, don't, come on come on Ben don't be you're doing yourself a disservice there come on come on <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes I get Craig Dawson sometimes I get Stephen Merchant and sometimes I get Russell Howard so those watching can decide which is the closest lookalike throw them in a blender and see what you get. I'm going to get Christian Eriksen actually as well. That's a good show. That's a good show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the you got the skills that Christian has, yeah. Mm, I mean, I used to have an okay left foot playing for Odeby Owls in Leicestershire, and then as I got older and I started showboating, I got ankle breakers, and then I gave up <laughs> and went <into> broadcasting. <laughs> but at least you found your niche, my friend. At least you found <laughs> yeah. your niche. Um, yeah, so I suppose that's a good way to start. I mean, give us a bit of a background. I mean, a lot of a lot of Chelsea fans uh, were aware of your work during the whole uh, the takeover process, and um, you're not even a Chelsea fan. So that's that's the that's the funny part of it. It was like we need an outsider to come in and steady this <laughs> ship on Twitter and on social media. So how? Like, how did you get involved in that, I suppose? And you, you can talk a bit about your, your journalism background as well, if you wish. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always great to engage with Chelsea fans. That's the one thing I'd preface all of this with. The, the fan base on social media, very intelligent, respectful, engaged and clued up. And that's what a social media platform should all be about. Sure. And I'm a senior reporter with CBS, a big American broadcaster, and really we're more about and me specifically focuses on storytelling investigative journalism when sport meets business or finance and we'll stay away at cbs but also me historically from where possible the gossip side because that day-to-day -day doesn't necessarily have a place with our audience so sure. cbs covers champions league Serie A live games, pitch side reporting, and my role will be about storytelling where possible to get exclusive interviews or insight. And the in point, I suppose, with the Chelsea takeover specifically was just because it, and also many of the other suitors and the group actually determining who would win all have American links. So naturally both myself, my colleagues at CBS, the company at large, all relatively good ins through the fortune of the consortiums at large anyway, certainly the ones that were serious and shortlisted, or having those US links. So that gave us decent insight. I've always had a very good connection with Chelsea Football Club as well. Actually, a little known fact that those of a slightly older generation may be aware of is that one of my first ever gigs was covering for an excellent commentator who's now at Sky Sports called Gary Taphouse doing Chelsea play-by-play -play for radio on Sirius and what used to be Jazz FM, a slightly strange home for Chelsea Football Club. But I used to come in and do a handful of games during Jose Mourinho's first spell as well. So I know the kind of Chelsea hierarchy pretty well. I know a number of ex-Chelsea players and current ones. And obviously we've got good ins as well with those consortia that tried to buy the football club. So it was kind of a perfect storm in that respect. And you find this sometimes, certainly not the first takeover that I've covered where you're just able to reach out to the right people at the right time and provide insight. And my speciality is exactly that, sport meets business and takeovers. So I was across the Newcastle United takeover and a Leeds United takeover historically when they had a Middle East owner
China, the PSG ownership, because I've lived and worked in places like Dubai and Qatar, and even the ones that haven't happened, links between Saudi Arabia and whoever, or Qatar and whoever, they come up regularly and I've been able to use my contact book to kind of be across them. So that was kind of my in point. Really enjoy covering a takeover over, say, transfer gossip because you get better insight and perspective and they tend, once they start snowballing, to be relatively reliable in being able to put together a story without the twists and turns, predominantly because a consortium will try to buy a football club, sure. whereas in the transfer sure. market, you find players will agree multiple deals and suitors come left, right and centre. So it's a more interesting and in-depth narrative that I've just always enjoyed telling. Yeah, and I mean, I suppose like there are some pretty big takeovers, but this is probably, I mean, we say it as Chelsea fans, but I think legitimately probably is the biggest, um, you know, takeover of a sports franchise, if we want to use that term, to use an American term, it probably is the biggest deal probably in, 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 a, in a team sports history or in any sport, maybe. Um, so it must have been pretty, pretty baffling as to how um, many, I suppose, bidders that you had to decipher, you know, to, to go through and decipher, okay, where are we now? How, how do we get down to the final four, final five, final six? Um, you obviously have fun doing it, but um, what was the process like trying to kind of, I suppose, weed out the, uh, what would you say, the, the chancers from the legitimate, from the legitimate bidders? Yeah, the interesting thing about the takeover and the paradox was that if you asked the UK government, it was a fire sale. And if you asked Chelsea, it was structured and rigid. And the friction, I think, between the government and the football club in the closing stages was because the government felt they'd given as much leeway as they possibly could, including extending the special licence. And their feeling was that Chelsea were doing everything on their own terms when arguably in a sale of this magnitude, but also due to the circumstances, the government's perspective was always that it should have been done on their terms and timescale, not Chelsea's. And then in the middle, you have Rain Group employed by Chelsea to put together a process. And let's not forget, start to finish, 85 days passed, which is incredibly quick, unprecedented yeah. for a sale of this magnitude. So when fans got frustrated by the delays that was probably only due to the fact that too many deadlines had leaked out and when they didn't materialize or simply when announcements of shortlists were not made public on those dates there was a feeling that somehow the process had been derailed or slowed down but none of this would have been possible without rain group and it is absolutely true to say whether it was a rain group official a senior chelsea executive or even government members people worked around the clock to get the deal done including failed bidders and of course eventually the successful clear lake Bowley consortium and from my point of view the best way of working out what was going on was to have regular dialogue yes with sources on all sides but that's just good practice journalism but in particular getting a sense from rain group was the best steer because naturally when you speak to a suitor they're going to big themselves up so then sure. it's very easy to get sucked in by interest that will not materialize and the reason why there's so much interest is because there's two ways of trying to get involved in Chelsea Football Club. One is to be a serious consortium or even individual and find your financing. And if you are a consortium, your partners, and then enter the bidding process. But due to the fact that it had to be done so quickly, you got a lot of individuals that either just declared a bid without a plan, and that's normal, perhaps in the hope that they would be shortlisted or that the financing to allow them to be more serious would come. And then you got a lot of very serious individuals that effectively didn't have a group. So it reminds me to try and simplify the analogy almost of a flat share, where you can advertise a flat as a landlord, and then you can seek interest from tenants. 
And some of the tenants that come to you will have the finances and will have filled all of the rooms. And you go, great, I've got a three bed in this analogy. Obviously, the landlord is Chelsea Football Club. I've got three people coming to me together. They can pay me. Off we go to the next stage. But you're also going to have people that just have a listing and say, I can pay 700, but I only want one room. And effectively, that was Todd Bowley and Hans Jörg Weiss. But there was at least a dozen others in that category that came and wanted a slice of the cake, but didn't have a consortium or a plan. And in the case of Weiss and Bowley, they came and said, listen, we want to bid. We've got some capital. We've got a plan. But in Bowley's case, he only ever wanted to be the minority and then build a team to together and collaboratively <clears throat> by Chelsea Football Club. And that's why now there's a lot of different members with a lot of different areas of expertise. And as a journalist, all you can really do is verify everything, that's number one, rather than only believe the line of a singular consortium sure. and then keep in regular contact. And the more trustworthy your information is, the more likely you are to keep being given information when appropriate and on record and not confidential by the various parties. And it's that steer, or sometimes it's called a media briefing. Sometimes it's just your personal relationship with an individual contact. There's no one way of doing it. But the main thing is if you jump the gun or to conclusions or go with one source without checking with two or three others, if you're wrong, you don't only lose the trust of those reading your work, but you lose the trust of your sources. So therefore, when you then go back to Rain Group or Chelsea or the UK government, you potentially hit a roadblock where they say, well, you were wrong that time, or we didn't really like the fact you put that out there without sense checking it with us. So you have to kind of take baby steps as a journalist. And then obviously sure. it's actually easier after it becomes one or certainly when it gets to a short list of just a handful because then you're not chasing around trying to develop relationships with dozens of suitors you're able to focus your work to the one or originally the four that were through to the final stages yeah no, no that makes a lot of sense and i suppose we that that's pretty that's a good segue actually because we can get into talking about Bowley himself he seems like a kind of a uh, a very hands-on guy we know he's got the hollywood report and all that kind of stuff that he works on he's got so many different kind of um pies in the oven basically and they you know they've come out um cooked pretty well i would say um he's a pretty successful guy and um, we look I, i've done a bit of you know on a smaller scale but i've done a little bit of research into his work with the dodgers and um, i know they have um i know himself and mark walter are a pretty good team there um it's kind of funny isn't it when they kind of rebuilt the dodgers they had a hand in rebuilding the dodgers of course but when they rebuilt the dodgers they went about it in a very very strategic way as well you know um bringing in a lot of players on you know that were free signings and stuff like that and we're kind of noticing that when we get onto it later that they're kind of looking at um looking at the market and seeing how they can kind of minimize the the output in terms of a transfer fee but kind of maximizing um the the talent that they bring in maybe on higher wages, but on long-term deals. So that can kind of maximize the potential value of the player going forward. If, if, if the pitch, if the player uh, or players are successful on the pitch. So when you were looking into Bowley himself, and this will be the last kind of bit we'll talk about before we get into transfers and stuff. When we look at Bowley himself, he's a pretty impressive guy, isn't he? Cause I've looked at him in interviews as well. He's, he's quite analytical. He's quite well-spoken. He's quite calm. He's got that kind of Kevin Costner look, so he makes you feel, I don't know, uh, he has a bit of a Kevin Costner head, I think. Um, <laughs> but he's, um, he's, he's a pretty charming, likable guy, but not in the sense that, say, a lot of UK or Europeans would call, unfortunately, would call Americans kind of cheesy or overselling. You know what I mean? He's quite soft-spoken for... Um, for an American, and I mean that with all respect to Americans. I have a lot of American friends, so they know what I mean. I just think that he couldn't be more different to Roman Abramovich. I mean, the yeah. bottom line is that when fans judge owners or ownership groups, they're always going to do so based upon trophies won. And Abramovich will always have the sentiment of the fan base. And it doesn't matter what any new owner does or individual, if the football team don't maintain success, 
they will come under criticism. Yeah. But they're in for the long game. And the hope is that they're inheriting in the short term a very strong football side of the business. And Todd Bowley is very strategic, as you say, analytical, personable, transparent. I expect engagement with the media and the fan base as well. And he's all about people, culture and structure. Whereas with Abramovich, it was a more cutthroat strategy of not being afraid to hire and fire, big spending, surplus spending. The new ownership group led by Boley in an operational sense will be far more patient, I think, with managers, with results. And that's not to say that they won't spend and be cutthroat if they have to, but it's all about buying a player or making a decision if it's not about football with a purpose. And by that, I mean, if you buy a player, you're also considering what will happen to the player and are they the right fit after a manager might leave? You're contemplating what are they going to be like in the dressing room, which might be important with a Dembele or a Rick Carlison because you don't want a bad egg and Liverpool are very good at doing that as well. Yeah. It's about empowering managers, Emma Hayes and Thomas Tuchel to be part of the recruitment process, but also protecting the club should they move on to make sure that some decisions are by committee. And the fact that Bowley is in all likelihood going to be chair replacing Bruce Buck tells you how hands-on he wants to be. And what he does is make decisive decisions when he has to, but delegate at other times, which is why there'll be close working relationships with the football department, but also he'll allow Jonathan Goldstein to lead on the redevelopment side, in all likelihood, along with David Hickey, who was named in the bid and was the former consultant when Roman Abramovich considered redevelopment. And all of this delegation in different areas of the brand, of the finances, of the recruitment, of the redevelopment, each aspect will have more than one person. And Bowley will connect them and will have input, but Bedag Egbali from Clear Lake Capital will be a huge part of the financial decisions sure. and the growth of the brand, particularly in a globalization sense. And Johnny Goldstein, as I said before, even though he's not on the board, will have a huge role to play. And when you talk about Bowley at Chelsea now, it's important to actually consider him as a double act with Goldstein, because these two have a pre-existing and strong working relationship. Jonathan Goldstein is the CEO of Kane International, which Bowley part owns, and they work together and have done very effectively day on day. And anyone with perhaps concerns that if Bowley is chair, he'll run back off to America or he'll be too overloaded with other commitments, perhaps fails to factor in that Goldstein is going to be there pretty much day on day. And then obviously Bruce Buck, even though he's leaving, is retained on as a senior advisor. So that transitional period can almost be indefinite. And in Marina's case, it's obvious that they're going to have to recruit, but they're not going to let her go before a handover or a transitional period has taken place. That's the sort of interesting gap because Bowley will part lead on negotiations and he's happy to do that. But he's obviously being advised by the previous regime and by people, for example, like Petr Cech. But the reason that's intriguing is just because traditionally with that role, due to the fact they could join a rival and they're gaining legal insider knowledge the longer that they stay at the club without even necessarily meaning to, you have to put them on gardening leave quickly, as we saw when Dan Ashworth left Brighton and went to Newcastle United. You don't want someone with that level of knowledge staying at the club with Buck. You can keep him on. But with anyone that's negotiating and signing, if you keep them on, let's say, until the end of the window, there's a danger, even inadvertently, that wherever they go next, they'll know more than you want them to. Not because they've literally and illegally in any sense gone through your contact book or taken anything they shouldn't, but if they're part of a negotiation that doesn't come off, they'll know the terms, they'll know the prices, they'll know the targets. And more importantly, a football club tends to work once two windows ahead at large, even if fans don't always see that. So again, the longer you keep on a marina, the more work she'll be doing for windows that she won't then be a part of. So it's a little bit of a precarious situation, but it is very normal 
to put someone of that position on gardening leave and then Bowley obviously has to step up and take a more proactive role but that's more temporary and after Chelsea get through this window I don't expect him to still be leading on every transfer but it might be a necessity towards the middle and back end of this window but Bowley basically will be transparent he'll be proactive he'll be ambitious he'll be strategic but he'll also delegate where he needs to be and I think that's a good balance and I think that Chelsea fans will notice off the field a big big difference between Abramovich who they basically never heard from and with Bowley who will be very willing to talk directly to the fan base which is which is kind of music to our ears as well and I think you know I, I heard a murmur I don't know how true it is but I'd imagine it's probably got some element of truth that uh, Todd Bowley obviously wants to buy a property in London as well if you're if you're here for 10 years at least you'd obviously want to have a base and not be living out of hotels because I would imagine we're probably going to see Bowley a lot at the bridge. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be every week. We didn't always see, you know, we didn't always see a Bro- Roman Abramovich every single week, even though we saw him a lot. Um, so I'd imagine he's probably going to set up a base here, right? Absolutely. I mean, you can't be the Chelsea minority owner, but effectively the operational lead and then be the chair and either, as you say, live out of a hotel or fly in all the time. So it's a commitment, not just from Bowley, but from Clear Lake Bowley as a group to, as you've already said, be there for 10 years. The 10 years is specific to Clear Lake Capital as the minority owner, but obviously within the rest of the group, you don't have their level of long-term ambition. And that's the sort of paradox here, that the long-term ambition shows their commitment And in five or 10 years time, when that improves the fan engagement and the connection between owners and fans, when it gets the redevelopment off the ground, when it makes Chelsea more sustainable, these are all essential to future proofing the club, especially coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. But that's no comfort to fans if they don't see something in the short term. And that is the irony that a Chelsea fan right now wants signings in this window, wants to (laughs) have any outgoings resolved, wants to ensure that the club closed the gap between Liverpool and Manchester City and wants to see the women's team continue to succeed. And it's good to see that they've already had a couple of marquee signings to add depth as they look to challenge in the Women's Champions League. So you have to kind of balance the, is this ownership group good for us in the long term? And if I jump in a TARDIS and it ends up in 2032, what will Chelsea Football Club look like? And the answer is very healthy. But in the short term, fans want to make sure that this ownership group continue the level of ambition on the field and spending of Roman Abramovich. And it's very difficult to do that when you've got two very strong teams both with strong recruitment models and both with star players like Liverpool and Manchester City. And with City adding Haaland and Liverpool adding Nunez and Chelsea losing Lukaku, you start to say, well, how right now, even if a few names do come in, is that gap closed? Or if it isn't, how at least to Chelsea ensure that they challenge in the Champions League and give the fans a guaranteed Champions League football qualification again with Spurs spending, with Arsenal expected to have a good window and so on. So that's the sort of challenge that this ownership group are inheriting the football side and can't control it. And the things they can control aren't as sexy to the fan base like strategy and redevelopment. I mean, I think that goes down well, but it's not going to happen overnight. So you have to kind of balance how much of the football side they can influence in the three weeks that they've been at the football club. Because even this window, a lot of it is either defined by the previous regime or altered by the sanctions which set Chelsea behind other football clubs. So patience is definitely necessary. But one thing I know from talking to sources within Clear Lake Bowley is that the level of ambition, even though they'll approach the task at hand differently, is identical to Roman Abramovich. They are not in this to make money or to turn Chelsea into a brand or a business. They are mad football fans that naturally, like you'd expect from any owner, just want to keep winning. Yeah, and, and I mean, that that is music to our ears, but I am kind of one of the Chelsea fans that is kind of more on the patient level. And I see the long-term vision here and I see, you know, I'm, I'm willing to kind of give it, you know, the two or three kind of four windows 
and maybe look at next season closing the gap even further, but laying the foundations, um, by laying the foundations, I suppose, one very important thing seems to be apparent, you know, when you hear from certain journalists, and I know you're definitely going to have an idea on this, I think the Lukaku situation kind of speaks volume in that, in that now we actually don't have a player power culture. And I think that's something that we can look forward to as fans. And it's something that irked me. Oh my God. Over my whole, over the whole Roman Abramovich tenure. I mean, I was a fan since the, since the early nineties. So that's always bothered me. You obviously would agree that this is pretty much a sign of Todd Bowley standing in solidarity with Thomas Tuchel. And I think this is basically going to be Thomas Tuchel's window, obviously with input from other, from other people. Um, but this is, I think, I think we're going to see some really, really big changes right off the bat in that sense. Would I be right, Ben? Well, Bowley is going to back Tuchel and Hayes and he's going to give them enhanced control and he's relying on their expertise and targets and then seeing what's feasible. Some of the targets won't be feasible. Lewandowski most likely being the best example and still potentially Dembele. But with Lukaku specifically, I wouldn't say that it's Bowley siding with Tuchel. I think he's showing that he is sensible and is trying to get market value in what's proven to be a very complicated deal. And by that, I mean the following, that there is a friction between Tuchel and Lukaku, at least professionally speaking. And for whatever reason, the 100 million odd signing hasn't worked, but from Lukaku's perspective, he feels like he should be a focal point tactically and that his goals at every other club dating all the way back to his first spell at Chelsea, which is obviously the only barren period, prove that he's worth that <coughs> fee and worth building a team around. And obviously Thomas Tuchel has used more of a rotational strategy and there's a variety of other players that seemingly are a better fit, all leading to only eight Premier League goals, which is the first time in the Premier League since that first spell at Chelsea that Lukaku in the Premier League has failed to get into double figures. And then the challenge is beneath that Tuchel-Lukaku relationship, you have Lukaku going away and grooming a move to Inter and talking about his love for that club and how he's got unfinished business and then trying to force for want of a better word, a move back there, which obviously from Chelsea's point of view is not deemed to be the best way of doing things. And in an ideal world, of course, it would have been good if either in January or to the new owners when they arrived, Lukaku just said very openly, listen, I want this to be cordial. I'd like to go back to Inter. What's the best way of doing it? But even if that conversation happened, the backstory is very hard to forget. And that's why the fan base have turned on Lukaku. But the reason why I say that this isn't just about Bowley supporting Tuchel specifically on Lukaku is because Bowley's gone to Inter and tried to get the best possible deal that he can. And the first port of call and Chelsea's original preference was to do a swap deal. And a swap deal would have facilitated a permanent move because Chelsea would have got the players that they wanted, probably a defender. Lautaro Martinez was never a realistic possibility. I think people forget that Martinez and Lukaku are great friends. And there's no way that Martinez would go to Stamford Bridge because his first reference for what it's like there on the manager and the club would unfortunately, from Chelsea's perspective, have been Romelu Lukaku. But Intersources had always also told me that Martinez was not for sale. But Skriniar was was for sale, which I found kind of, I suppose, which is kind of really... I suppose, peed off a lot of Chelsea fans is the fact that Skriniar is available. I know they've got to make money in a certain way. They've got to get players in. But the fact, maybe, now, this is my real question to you. He was brought in for 97 million. Obviously, the full 97 million has not been paid. So I've actually had a couple of uh, questions from fans today that actually wanted me to ask you. In terms of what we have already paid, could that not have almost been written off in in a, a a kind of a swap deal environment, and um, I know it's a tricky. And look, a lot of a lot of people are FIFA football fans, and they think deals are just you know as simple as you know making a 
pressing the X button and you've got your new signing. But it's very strange because we thought Bastoni was available, but Skriniar we know was available and there was going to PSG. Do we think that Inter have been a little bit greedy in here? And is it a case that, well, we know they are, but uh, is it a case that Bowley has kind of got what he wanted in terms of getting the wages off the off the wage bill? Or, you know, what, what, what's... It's a little bit of that. I mean, the first thing, like you say, is you can't just naturally put things that fit together neatly on paper because sure. the reality is more complicated. So with a swap deal, it's always difficult because you're not then just offloading a player, but you've got to persuade a player to come the other way. And Bastoni could go, but he is also very settled there. He enjoys the culture and the climate. And the agent had said that he was definitely staying. It's always to be taken with a pinch of salt when that's said. But Skriniar was always the one that I was told was available in the market. And I think that Inter fans balked at that a little bit, but it is now clearly apparent that Inter are in talks with PSG and they feel that they can get a large fee on that. And I think that the swap deal that Chelsea wanted was for a defender and Dumfries, Bastoni and Skriniar were looked at. But Inter only really want to sell one defender. So if they think that they're going to get a straight, simple deal with more money out of PSG, and then they can still get Lukaku, it becomes win-win for them. And then they take any swap deal off the table. But the other thing is you've got to look at this from Bowley's point of view. So what often gets underreported in all of this is that Todd Bowley is not Thomas Tuchel. And Tuchel may have relayed the opinion about Romelu Lukaku, but Todd Bowley will look at the value of Lukaku as a hundred million odd player and his previous stats and wonder whether the situation is ever redeemable or there's a possibility in the short term. You never know what's going to happen in football that Thomas Tuchel departs and a new manager comes in and wants Romelu Lukaku. So when fans see this eight to 10 million euros deal <clears throat> plus add-ons and say, that's ridiculous. It's basically 10 odd percent and we haven't got a player. It's actually the opposite that Chelsea have got money in and because it will in all likelihood just be a season by season to begin with, because you can't do a two season loan. Sure. Yeah. If he does well at Inter, you'll repeat the terms and then suddenly you've got 16 to 20 million and still Lukaku off the wage bill. And without the optional obligation to buy, there's still that ability to bring Lukaku back. And I think that's a Chelsea term. I think that in an ideal world, Inter would like Lukaku to be theirs, even though Dybala looks on the way and Martinez will stay. And from Chelsea's point of view, I think that their logic is, well, what if he had a blinding season or two in Italy and then came back? I think most are in agreement that that might be under a new manager, but you never know if he does that well at Inter and Chelsea need a goal scorer. Thomas Tuchel might say, let's just put everything behind us. The question is, would Lukaku want to come back to Stamford Bridge? And that is the sticking point at the moment. But I think Bowley thinks new era, new owners, a hundred million player, take the money, get him off the wage bill, see what happens in a year. And other than the debate over whether the relationship with Tuchel is or isn't repairable, and I think most fans listening will say, well, it just isn't, and Lukaku won't want to come back to Stamford Bridge. But other than that, and that is a debate rather than a fact, Sure. there's a possibility that if you take the money, get him away, get him off the wage bill, replace him, move on, see what happens in a year, then you hit a scenario where it's dealt with, but in a way where instead of Chelsea getting rid of a player like Tammy Abraham, good example, different circumstances I know, but absolutely on fire in Serie A, would some Chelsea fans want him back? I would say yes, if I'm giving my personal opinion about him, but it's one that kind of got away. And with Lukaku's price tag being so high, maybe the new ownership group are just looking for a short-term solution to solve a problem, and then you reassess it in a year's time. And I honestly don't think that that's a bad approach. It's good business. It's good business. It really, really is. Um, I know we're. I know you. You haven't got all night, so there's a couple of bits and pieces that I want to talk about. Obviously, you've touched on Marina and Book, so we don't really need to talk about that. Everybody knows the situation, but we can see the structure. Um, I would imagine 
um, over the next couple of months. We've saw the links with um, the Atletico Madrid director of football being linked heavily with Chelsea, I know. Um, there's been a couple of good sources saying that that is a possibility over the next couple of months. Can you confirm or deny? Or, well, I mean, the first thing again is that Chelsea's new ownership group were not sure whether Marina would stay or go. Sure, and they'd all said that they would come in, and that compared to Buck was much more of a two way conversation because she obviously feels quite tied to. Abramovich and the old regime, but very much admired nonetheless by the Clear Lake Bowley group. So it's not like they've had time to draw up a definitive short list, but it is true that Andrea Berta is a name that is admired by the ownership group. And I know fans hate hearing the word admired or respected or interested in monitored but... <laughs> monitored in <laughs> monitored fc i hear some fans saying that all the time yeah but with a senior executive you have to headhunt you have to know who's out there in the market you have to draw up a list and this is probably the weakest area for the new ownership group because they're not just going to have a sense of European football executives because they're not out there in the same way that a player is. They're not scouted in the same way. So talking to Atletico Madrid sources, they're very clear that Berta is committed to their football club, as you'd expect them to say, and will 100% work through this entire window. Once Chelsea confirm officially the departure of Marina most likely this week, things may change. And as I said before, you might find Berta suddenly goes on gardening leave like Dan Ashworth did at Brighton. And you still have to wait a fair few months for the appointment. But it's a sign then that there's some movement. But at this stage, regardless of what you read, there is nothing advanced with any potential director of football slash marina replacement because sure let's not forget that whatever title she carried she did a lot of different roles at the club and that's where the, the challenge that you almost have to work out who is going to fulfill what role within your board what areas you're going to recruit in and then appoint someone like berta in in a more rigid and defined role regardless of what titles say especially if thomas tuchel is going to have even more control and emma hayes as well over transfers or you have to actually bring in a variety of different positions at senior executive level to cover in practice the role that Marina played. So I think that fans will want to know who's replacing her. And I think, again, they're going to have to be quite patient on that. But Berta is a name in the mix, but there is absolutely nothing advanced or definite or imminent in that capacity yet. Yeah, my my thought, my thinking was kind of similar. You know, you've actually kind of uh, kind of confirmed that for me. My thinking was that you you'd be kind of looking more in towards the the mid season with that kind of a role being being looked at, being cleared up. You know what I mean? Um, after the window and not not now. I mean, it's again, it's not like football manager or FIFA. It's it'd be something that'll probably come in maybe maybe closer to uh, closer to Christmas time that they would be looking at getting people in um in, in that you, kind of Adam, well, Ian, sorry to interrupt you just yeah, add, sure, you, sure. you just have to factor in too that atleti will inevitably put berta on gardening leave should he depart so yeah. if this window is taken care of because plans will have already been in place for it and then the window shuts and the season starts and chelsea make an appointment there's still a fair chance that berta won't be able to start work for six months and yeah. that may be negotiated by atletico to make sure that he cannot be in place even potentially for the january window so this isn't a quick fix but what is important is that marina leaves the appropriate handover and the rest of the football department step up to cover her departure should she go sooner rather than later yeah so it's more it's more kind of like later in the season aiming towards next season that you'd be looking at somebody possibly coming in in that sense that that does make sense um Roy, we're gonna we're gonna give the the chelsea fans some fun now because this is really what what the uh what they want to know um <clears throat> i said to you off air We'd kind of do a little bit of a, a little bit of, of a game, um, not a game, but just 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 give people some kind of hope and kind of try and um, put their expectations, um, I suppose, in reality rather than fantasy land. 
You know what I mean? Um, so Armanda Broya, uh, you put up a tweet yesterday saying that there's nothing confirmed. Obviously, Thomas Tuchel does want to take a look at him. So this whole 30 million uh, pound move to West Ham with a possible buyback, is th- there's been no confirmation or clarification on that whatsoever, right? Nothing. I mean, West Ham have made no advanced move, no formal offer, no direct contact with the player. And Chelsea haven't, as I understand it anyway, intimated a specific price. And the reason for that is because they're busy dealing with Lukaku's exit, which will be confirmed imminently. And Thomas Tuchel wants to assess Broya in pre-season because he was excellent on loan at Southampton. He's 20 years of age. So the debate is threefold and you've alluded to one of them. You either loan him out, you permanently sell him or you sell him and put in a buyback option. And until Tuchel sees him and speaks to the player as well, the situation won't become clear because Broya wants to play football and has now done in the Premier League. So if Tuchel likes him, he'll stay at Chelsea. If Tuchel persuades him to be a squad player, he'll stay at Chelsea. But as ever, the thing that's always forgotten in all of this is the personal inclination of the player in areas such as mental health and lifestyle. So forgetting the football, forgetting the ambition, forgetting the aspiration. Bro is 20 years of age. He's been out on loan at Vitesse and Southampton, and he may want regular game time. So Thomas Tuchel may say, I want to keep him. But if the player then turns around and says, well, how often am I going to play? Or I don't want to be sent out on loan again, then Chelsea will have to adapt. So I think that if Tuchel thinks he's part of the first team plans, they won't sell him to a West Ham or a Napoli for anything. If Tuchel speaks to the player and Broya says, I don't want to go out on loan again, then the club and player have a decision to make because that is still a very logical way of doing it. Chelsea like him. They assess him in pre-season. They loan him, let's say, to a West Ham. They get some money from it and a percentage, if not all of the wages paid, and then he's still a Chelsea player. And if he scores eight to 10 goals again, then you're suddenly thinking now he's perfect because in back-to-back Premier League seasons, he's proven he can do this. And obviously West Ham are expected to be a top half team. So not too far off Chelsea, but it all depends on the player. And Broya may say, I just don't want to do that because I don't want to make another move. I don't want to have another dressing room. I don't want to have another manager. At which point Chelsea would either have to sell permanently or sell with a buyback clause. And that may change the dynamic, the wishes of the players. But right now, nothing is going to happen before one, Broya returns to pre-season and two, Tuchel and Broya speak directly. Cool. Right, so we're going to go through, um, we're going to go through each, each position and just, I'm not going to mention names or anything, but you can kind of talk about what you've heard. Um, goalkeepers, obviously, this is, you know, it's kind of gone under the radar, but not for me. Obviously, we have um, we have Mendy, who is, you know, the undisputed number one at the moment. Um, Kepa, who is on quite a high wage, wants a move, um, but has been very respectful, I think, to the club. Uh, throughout the whole process, even though he knows the, even though we all know the the huge transfer fee, have you heard anything about goalkeepers' possible outgoings, uh, incomings? It's interesting, isn't it? Because we need to establish Kepa's future, yeah. and then that defines the strategy. Because Chelsea want to sign a goalkeeper, and yeah. option A is Kepa stays, and then you bring in a young goalkeeper, Slavina being the name mentioned, and he is drawn by a Chelsea move, and Chelsea are ahead of Real Madrid, but. If you make that move, then I don't see them bringing in two goalkeepers. So that may be an indication that Kepa will be with Chelsea for the season, which is great news for fans because you've got two world-class goalkeepers. Yep. But from Kepa's point of view, it's pretty demoralising to stay at Chelsea when he could be the number one goalkeeper at a number of top Premier League or European clubs. And then similarly, if Kepa goes, the logic of Slonina is in my opinion, more just one for the long term. And Chelsea may not make a move and even potentially risk losing him because there's plenty of European clubs looking at him. And then someone like uh, Gabriel Slonina is more likely in my, uh, not Gabriel Slonina, sorry, uh, Thomas Strakosha is is more likely in my opinion, because in uh, Strakosha, you have somebody who is experienced at 27 years of age, 
has uh, played hundreds of games for Lazio, has been capped at international level, uh, has already said he's honoured by the link with Chelsea and would know coming in, even though he's a very good goalkeeper, that his game time would be limited to uh, the cups or injuries. So then you've got a Kepa replacement and Mendy is obviously the number one goalkeeper. And I think that is going to be very hard to tell any goalkeeper and persuade them that Mendy will be ousted. The, the best way of Mendy being ousted is probably Kepa being blinding if he gets a run in the side and then changing Tuchel's mind. But a new signing like a Strakosha and definitely and obviously a young keeper like a Slanina are going to be nowhere near Mendy. So um, a lot depends on Kepa, in, in my opinion, as to the approach that Chelsea make on this. And I think that even though goalkeepers are priority, I think they've got so much else on at the moment that um, none of those um, signings will be imminent. Do you think it's likely to see Kepa gone in this window or just, just off your own? In your own opinion, I suppose. I mean, I would be staggered if somebody doesn't come in for Kepa. So then it once again comes back to, is he happy at Chelsea fighting for the number one spot, but being in all likelihood a number two? And the slight sort of twist is, is there a narrative that actually has Strakosha go from Lazio and then Kepa going to Lazio and that it's, might be a possibility yeah. as well yeah I've heard that okay well let's get on to I suppose this is as important as <laughs> I suppose as any of the positions defenders so obviously we're getting a lot of impatience within the Chelsea fan base um with Jules Koundé because we're two years into it now um also we've heard a lot of the uh, I will use the term rags I can do that from my uh, from my perspective, saying that uh, his camp are getting impatient with Chelsea now and trying to kind of, I suppose, pawn him off to Barcelona and stuff like that. So, um, you you can mention the defenders, realistic defenders that you because obviously we've been linked with absolutely everybody, from Nathan Aki to Koulibaly to Jules Koundé to the Ligt, and the list goes on. Um, Give us, uh, give us some some thoughts and, and perspective on, uh, on on the pursuit for, I suppose, two defenders essentially. Yeah, I mean, defenders is the area where Chelsea absolutely have to strengthen, and centre back, right back are probably the two main areas, or a versatile defender that can even potentially play in both positions. Some will kind of argue centre back is. Priority number one, because Aspilicueta hasn't gone gone and is more maybe conducive to being persuaded to stay. But, you know, the feeling is that Aspilicueta and Alonso will go to Spain. And yeah. therefore, when you look at the defence, you start to think, yikes, and who's going to partner Thiago Silva at centre-back and who's going to replace Aspilicueta? So those are the two priorities in defence. Uh, Jules Kunde, big priority. As you say, Chelsea have been working on the deal for a long, long time. No problem between Chelsea and the player. So when the reports come out that there's a frustration, that's not between the agent player and Chelsea. It's a frustration by the agent that Chelsea aren't paying up the appropriate amount to Sevilla to just get the deal done. And then Barcelona's entry point into it makes things interesting because you've got a rival suitor. So on the one hand, Sevilla can up the price, but on the other hand, Barcelona can't at this stage afford that price either. No. So it could well be that Barcelona's being used as a little bit of leverage, even if Kunde is interested in theory in that club and I say in theory only because there's nothing advanced there yet between Barcelona and Kunde and also a tactic is for an agent to go to a club like Barcelona offer the player come back to Chelsea and say they're interested it's a way of putting pressure on them to speed up potentially but Chelsea are miles ahead of Barcelona and I would still expect Kunde to be done. Severe are playing a little bit hardball, although it depends what narrative you believe, because one of the first interviews that I did on Kunde, I'd said openly that I thought Chelsea would be asked to pay the release fee, which is a lot higher than the kind of 
50 million euros or so that perhaps Chelsea are hoping to pay. And most people came back to me and said, there's no way they'll have to actually meet the release clause, but it might well be, especially if Barcelona's interest proves genuine and advances that Chelsea do have to pay a little bit more and then they'll have a decision to make. But Kunde, very much a realistic target. I've had complete confirmation on that one. And then, as you've correctly said, there's a host of other defenders out there. I think Delete, there's substance in Koulibaly as well. Chelsea have definitely looked at the challenge with Koulibaly is the fee and whether actually there's a desire to sell him, whereas a delete is available on the market. There's no truth in some of the more far-fetched names. Uh, Wesley Fofana will not join Chelsea. Leicester simply won't sell him. I've had that categorically stated. He'd be a very good signing, by the way, but Fofana yeah. won't go. Yeah. Even for the 80, 90 million that's being speculatively touted, Harry Maguire, as Richard Keyes, I think, suggested, is not going to be leaving Manchester United for Chelsea, even if he was available. That's all Chelsea bless ourselves with that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, you come back to the inter defenders that have been linked. Um, you have to presume <clears throat> if they weren't available in a swap deal that Chelsea are not now going to go back in a straight deal. So that also takes Bastoni and Skriniar and Dumfries off the table. So I think that if Chelsea are to <coughs> get more than one defender, Kunde is probably the one that still is the most likely, even if talks have stagnated a little bit. And then I would wager, but it is only my personal opinion, that delete is a realistic possibility. And if there is a genuine desire to sell Koulibaly at a market value price, then he comes into the equation as well. So you've kind of, yeah, that's, I, I was kind of thinking Delete or Koulibaly. They're both um, the two. I think that would be narrowed down as to being realistic. I suppose Koulibaly would still be cheaper. And I suppose he's 30 years of age now. So I, I suppose that still leaves a path for Levi Caldwell to possibly go out on a Premier League loan because we don't really want to see him stay on the bench a lot this season. Um, and especially with players like Ampadu coming back, who can obviously cover multiple positions and has had a uh, has had a, a, a pretty decent, I think, loan um, and, and, and is always a, a regular for Wales. So um, I'm sure Thomas Tuchel is going to want to look at him as well. Um, I don't know whether you could, you know, I suppose the the Ampadu fan in me would like to see him get a chance Um you know, at least in preseason, to see what Thomas Tuchel thinks of him. Um, could could you see a future for him at Chelsea, or do you think it's for Levi Colwell? Well, well, I think Colwell is a shoe in, but but uh, Ampadu. Yeah, I think so. I mean, just one final point I was going to say in response to what you said, which I think was a very uh, valid point on um, Koulibaly. Is it's not so much the fee for the 30 year old uh, although it would be relatively high and Napoli are kind of being forced to some extent to cash in it's more just the power of um, the uh, Napoli manager who might complicate things because there's sort of a feeling to some extent from talking to sources in Italy that Spalletti has basically gone to his board at Napoli and said, I don't care if you've got offers in, if you sell, I'll walk. Now, sometimes these things are sensationalized, but a number of sources have basically said that it has been made clear in no uncertain terms that um, Spalletti does not want Koulibaly to go. So that will be an interesting test between board ownership group and manager. And then I think that the Amadou future is a interesting one. My kind of concern with that is just where he would fall in the pecking order. And when you have the volume of outgoings that Chelsea have in defence, and when you have the sort of list of targets that Chelsea are already chasing, I think that there is a danger that somebody like Amadou gets lost in that conversation. 
And yeah. I think the reason for that is because, first of all, you need a center back, right? And you need a right back. And Amadou doesn't necessarily fall into either of those categories. So then if you went to Napoli and got him, and I think Spurs are also looking at him as well, you'd be bringing in an incredible player in midfield, but you wouldn't be filling a defensive void. And then if Chelsea are looking at Dembele in the same position, I'm not sure that he becomes priority number one. Okay. And so, I mean, if you were to, if you again, this is only your personal opinion. If you had to, um, you know, narrow it down to the two players that you've mentioned, uh, Matthias De Ligt or uh, Khalidou Koulibaly, who just, 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 just for fun, who mm. could you realistically see at Stamford Bridge next year? Because I mean, I think they're, I think they're definitely gonna, as you say, they need to sign two. Or do you think they're gonna give Levi Caldwell a chance instead? I don't, but. No, I mean, I think Cobble was not developed enough at this point. No. And therefore, you have to try and, and bring in two defenders, assuming that Aspilicueta does go, although that's not a complete given. Delete, I think, is above Koulibaly in okay. Chelsea's estimation, uh, simply because one's 22, one's 30, and one is available in the market or will be persuaded to leave and the other um, Napoli are being a little bit more staunch. And I think the final thing maybe with Koulibaly is just that th there could also be a scenario where uh, Delete is sold and then uh, guess what? Juventus are the ones, as they have a history of doing, uh, yeah. swooping in. And taking Koulibaly, even though we were told that Napoli wouldn't sell him. So those kind of plot lines are possible. But I think, you know, if you're weighing up a 30-year-old who will be above market value because Napoli want to cash in and Juventus are looking at Koulibaly anyway, so Chelsea have got quite stiff competition there. Yeah. And then you're looking yeah. at Delete, who I genuinely think uh, could be somebody that Juventus would sell and is only 22 from a long-term value and strategic point of view, I think that Chelsea would go in for delete over Koulibaly, but both are on their shortlist. Okay, okay. Um, the midfield, we don't have to spend too long on it because obviously I don't think Declan Rice is going to happen this year. I just personally don't think it. Um, I think there's too short a window for us to sell one of Jorginho or Kante. I still think both will be there um, next season. And I do think that there may be, you know, contract negotiations there um to um you know to obviously strengthen their position and to, well it, it is possible they let one of them go on a, one or both of them go on a free i just can't see it um anything you've heard on the midfield side because that's one that's kind of a very tricky situation especially if we're going to go with the tree at the back again which looks likely this year there's only two players that can play Kovacic is definitely a shoe in in one of those positions and Connor Gallagher obviously is a player that you know Tuchel wants to look at. So we're you're in a situation where you're overloaded with midfield players. If we're potentially bringing one in and not getting rid of any, yeah, and I think it's a case of finding the right replacement, and then one of Jorginho Kante will probably go either this window or in January because you have to clear the decks. I mean, I suppose technically yes. Danny Drinkwater's left the club, but he barely played any time. <laughs> So isn't really factored into that excess of central midfielders even before he was released. Kante is an interesting one because he's loved by the Chelsea fan base, but there is an acceptance that perhaps he's just crossed over his peak. I'll tell you something, I'd take him back at my club, Leicester City, and then Jorginho may be falling into the same category, although the slight difference is still the fact that Jorginho can come on if he's a squad player and do things like set pieces yeah. and you know Kante doesn't control the game as much from dead ball situations so Jorginho might still have a, a little bit more worth whereas Kante could be moved on but I think you're absolutely right that it won't be a priority just to rush them out of the club and therefore when you're thinking of midfielders 
it's more for me uh, about Chelsea sitting down with, let's say, a Mason Mount and offering him improved terms to make sure he stays at the football club. And then if they're to bring in a more defensive-minded midfielder, you're talking about Amadou Diawara, Diawara who I mentioned before, um, as one potential option, um, former Napoli and uh, Roma defensive midfielder. Hadara is another one at Leipzig who has been on a, a pretty long shortlist. Um, I still can't understand why more clubs are not coming in for Yuri Tielemans as well, but it's just a position, as you say, that Chelsea have got plenty of cover and there's absolutely no link, by the way, between Chelsea and Yuri Tielemans. So, I know, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think they'll do anything with the midfield um, with the names that I've mentioned at this point, uh, which leaves that sort of uh, Dembele um, saga as the only one where we might still see some movement. And the situation there um, remains as is really where um, Usman Dembele does not at this point. Um, and, and, you know, obviously when we are talking about um, midfielders now, he falls into a winger slash forward category. Sure, sure, uh, so yeah. We've moved on a bit from the central midfield. Um, but, yeah, he's the only one uh, within that attack-minded, um, you know, midfield, if you like. Um, though, you know, really we're talking winger forward um, that we might see some movement on simply because uh, we know that Thomas Tuchel has told Todd Bowley that he wants a reunion there. And um, it just remains to be seen whether Chelsea can put something formal on the table that Dembele would agree to. And then he'd have to make a straight choice between Barcelona and Chelsea. PSG um, haven't only called their interest now, uh, they're fully not interested. They won't be signing Dembele. I uh, was told that today that um, they've not advanced anything. So even though Dembele, if he had a three-way choice, would pick PSG, he's not going to have that option. So he's going to have to pick between uh, Barcelona, Chelsea or no club. And um, if Chelsea put an offer down, it'll be interesting to see whether Barcelona then up their offer. And that's been the point of contention that Dembele wants higher wages and a better package. Barcelona don't want to give him that and they can't afford that. And um, at some point he's going to have to decide his future. And um, what's interesting about the Dembele uh, as well, just finally, is that um, on the one hand, there's bad blood developing between sort of the Barca board and Dembele. But on the other hand, he's a player that Xavi really wants to keep because he, he played really often in the second half of the season. I think he got something like 13 assists in yeah, 19. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. And he's perfect for Xavi's system. So Barcelona should be fighting to keep him, but financially uh, they can't. And they don't want to set a precedent of caving in after all this time. And that's why there's a window of opportunity for Chelsea. And yeah, I mean, if I was to be a betting man, I kind of see Chelsea winning that one, personally. Especially if, um, you know, if Azpilicueta and uh, Marcus Alonso, if those deals go smoothly, which I'm sure, as you've mentioned before, there's no reason for them not to go smoothly if both players want to go. And it's, it's you know, there's a reasonable kind of amicable decision between uh, between Todd Bowley, I suppose, and, and the two players. So, yeah, Dem Bailey... Um, could be one of the uh, incumbents. Obviously, the the favourite, which I have no transfer sources, which is great. Other than you now, Ben, thank you. Um, but but before before I met you, um, I had predicted that Hakim Ziyech be the one that would would leave because I just I seen him at the bridge. I seen him at the uh, I was there um, in, in the in the West End when when we played Brentford, and I see why Tuchel doesn't play him a lot even though he's got a certain set of skills that are you know fantastic um in a certain setup but he's definitely seems to be the one um out of all the forwards that we have right now so if you've got Ziyech leaving and Lukaku leaving you're going to need to bring in two to replace him and of course the two mentioned are then Bailey and Raheem Sterling who we'll get on to I suppose lastly um, but uh, are you hearing anything about Hakim Ziyech? I know AC Milan have been linked to him and they kind of have been regularly. Yeah, I think that Ziyech is the most likely of the players that you mentioned to leave. I know that some will argue that Chelsea might listen to offers for Timo Werner, but I don't see that being no. the case. If they get something substantial in for Ziyech, He's the most likely. Pulisic has to be mentioned in the conversation, although my understanding remains that there are no Premier League clubs 
that are seriously chasing him, and that includes Liverpool. He was linked uh, before sure. Nunez joined the Mane replacement, and uh, some are saying somehow Everton as well as part of a uh, ambitious and audacious move for uh, Rick Carlson using Pulisic to go the other way. But again, that's been uh, shot down by the Everton sources that I have spoken to. So as you say, um, you, you have Dembele, you have Sterling, uh, you have Jesus, who is um, a name that Chelsea have looked at, but it, it seems like Arsenal are the front runners and uh, will get pretty close to completing that deal this week. And therefore, Chelsea are going to have to find a source of goals. So with the outgoings, uh, Ziyech is the most likely of Werner, Ziyech and Pulisic to uh, depart. But there hasn't been any kind of offer on the table. And the challenge with AC Milan, who are one of the clubs interested, that is correct, um, is that they can't afford him and you know they can't even afford Sven Botman at the moment who they're chasing Newcastle for at centre-back so it's going to be very difficult for them to actually get a permanent deal for Ziyech and you know Chelsea can't keep playing the Lukaku game and loaning out and taking small fees even if they think it makes market value and it it clears the wage bill at some point if they're going to line up a longer term bid for let's just say a Declan Rice who won't be available in this window um, but um, you know will be a Chelsea target let's say next summer they're going to have to start bringing in some funds so they need to cash in and I don't think that AC Milan are, are going to be able to afford uh, Ziyech but there are a few other players looking at him and one little side plot uh, which is quite interesting as of the last 24 hours uh, speaking to people close to Jesse Marsh at Leeds is if Leeds lose Rafinha then Ziyech may be a name that they look at so uh, watch this space on that front uh, because Leeds will need a source of creativity. Makes sense, um, actually. That makes that makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. And he's one player, but you know, it's not a given that Rafinha goes. Uh, Barcelona can't afford him. Um, Arsenal are again in the conversation, but um, there's a long, long way to go on agreeing a fee with Leeds United, and there's a long list of players Barcelona, if that is the leading club. Uh, want that they simply cannot afford and do not have the squad space for but um, the window has a long run and um, that may be a scenario and then yeah with the incomings we've discussed Dembele already but with Sterling uh, he hasn't made up his mind so whatever else you read he has not determined where he's going to go yet that's number one and he is waiting to see whether the interested clubs can agree a starting point of negotiation with Manchester City. And my understanding is that City want an equivalent fee for Jesus and Sterling, which will total about 90 odd million between the two of them, in all likelihood with some add-ons on top. So that's a high price to pay. Sterling was originally valued, as, as you'd expect when these feelers get put out there um, at roughly 60 million and for a player with a year left on his contract and especially compared to uh, Sadio Mane uh, that is a high high price yeah. but some of that as with Jesus negotiations will be shaved off and I think that Manchester City will eventually settle on a price of about 45 million uh, maybe with some add-ons some definite or, or likely uh, based upon appearances and goals and uh, some may be a bit more performance related that may or may not end up being paid. So then they'll still have that possibility of getting somewhere around 55 million all in. Um, but Chelsea will not have to pay that up front. The base fee, I think, will be 40 to 45 in the end. Chelsea's starting point, having not advanced it too far at the moment, is more like 35 million. And I think that if they are to get an agreement with City, they're going to have to add about 10 million to that price. And then uh, Sterling can start talking a bit more definitively. Uh, but right now, um, you know, there's no other club in the mix for Sterling that are more advanced than Chelsea. But until Sterling makes up his mind or Manchester City intimate the kind of ballpark that they're willing to seriously entertain, uh, nothing is going to develop. So, um, you know, as with Dembele, uh, Chelsea fans are going to have to be a little bit patient with this one uh, because I can see the Sterling transfer saga uh, certainly bleeding into the early part of July. Okay, well, let's let's finish off on a little uh, percentage game that I just thought up of there. And this is only this is nothing to do with your sources. Just just a percentage game because I know you can't say yay or nay. Um, so I'm going to mention a couple of players, and you give me the percentage of what you know what what percent you think it's likely or possible. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to stop you there because I don't do this game uh, <laughs> only purely because as fun as it is, 
I, I genuinely see it as irresponsible journalism. No, because that's not, fair. That's fair. A fan is nothing, nothing to do with um, not wanting to have a bit of fun. It's just that what you find is that on the Twitters of this world, people, people will, uh, yeah, they'll, 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 could, yeah. There's a seventy percent chance of a Dembele coming, sure. and then before you know it, you've sort of led a false narrative. Um, and I don't like misleading people. Um, I tell you what I know to the best of my knowledge. Um, and I have actually said before that, say, Dembele might be a 70-30 in Chelsea's favour comparative sure, to Barcelona. Sure, sure. As soon as you start saying, you know, it's 90% done or whatever, um, that's when you get into um, a difficult scenario. But what I will do uh, with the ones that are more advanced is I'll, I'll tell you what I think the percentage is, but sure. what I won't yeah, do yeah. Uh, that's with fair. a... What I won't do is with a, a rumoured player when it's not advanced like a Sterling, yeah. uh, pluck out a percentage out the blue uh, because I, I, I see that as journalists um, steering a more tabloid angle that I don't think is fair. To and to be fair, I respect that because I don't want I don't want my particular show linked to something that you've said that is, you know, a false narrative. So I, I respect that. Um, 100%. What I will say is um, just to indulge in the in the game from the handful that are more advanced, uh, Lukaku is obviously 100%. And, um, you know, I reported yesterday that that was when, not if. And that will be official after he does his medical. But those negotiations are uh, done. Oh. And uh, Chelsea wanted 10 million plus add ons. Um, I think they're going to get closer to eight, uh, but actually still what they wanted because the add ons are increased as the base loan fee is decreased. So, uh, sure. however sure. it ends up being reported, you don't lose anything from the amount Chelsea want. It's just structured in a way where um, Chelsea perhaps have to gamble a bit more on the add-ons, but if it goes to plan, they'll get what they want from that deal. And I believe that that will be a one-year loan and um, there'll be no obligation or option to buy, but it may be something that gets repeated after a year, especially if Inter can't afford a permanent transfer um, Chelsea could, of course, come back again in a year and say, well, now we want our player swap or we're bringing him back. And then you've got the leverage. So that's yeah. quite a useful thing to have up their sleeve as well. So to me, that's 100%. Uh, Jules Kunde, I still think, is 90% um, likely, um, providing that Chelsea don't walk away by the fee that Sevilla are demanding. But as the window drags on, I think what you find is... Um, the selling club has less leverage because deep down they want that sale. And then at that point they'll compromise somewhere and the deal will get done. And then um, of other deals, I suppose Dembele is probably the only one that um, is a little bit more advanced in terms of talks, although nothing formal is on the table. Sure. And uh, I'll sure. repeat what I said before on that, which is just that compared to him staying at Barcelona, if those remain the only two options that are presented, I think that it is 70-30 in Chelsea's favour unless Barcelona increase their offer. And if Barcelona increase their offer, I think it becomes 70-30 in Barcelona's favour. So there's a really interesting dynamic there, uh, which is why Chelsea have to move decisively in the market. Yeah, that's perfect. That's good enough for me. As I say, uh, you, you still played the game in your way and I like it and I appreciate it. Look, I love uh, journalistic integrity. Uh, there's not many of you, Ben, so I, I, uh, I applaud you for that. And uh, most importantly, I really do uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. And hopefully you'll hopefully you'll you'll come on again sometime. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Always happy to come on. And um, hopefully Chelsea start making a few signings and um, we uh, have a sort of exciting window uh, where all the clubs are making big signings. And if Chelsea can follow suit, then uh, a lot of the contenders for the Premier League and Champions League are going to be even stronger and we should we should be in for a really exciting season. 100%. Well, listen, guys, you can follow Ben. Ben, where can people follow your work? Obviously, you're on Twitter. Uh, let people know. Yeah, Twitter, at Jacobs Ben. And a shout out as well, obviously, to my uh, staff job, CBS uh, Sports Golasso, uh, G-O-L-A-Z-O uh, is the handle. And that's Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok on social media. And obviously, for those of you listening in uh, America, uh, you'll see and hear me um, when news breaks on uh, CBS Sports HQ, which is our sort of uh, broadcast equivalent of Sky Sports News. Awesome. Well, Ben, until next time, it's been an absolute pleasure, sir. Thank you for uh, giving me so much of your time this evening. Um, and to all of our Chelsea Roar fans, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. 
Ben is an absolute wealth of knowledge. Follow him on all these platforms. He is a proper source of information and won't feed you full of BS. So uh, until the next time, for me, your host, Ian Kelly, this has been the Chelsea Roar. Until next time, we are over and out.